I'm glad you're still here, and we're going to have a message. And I may have to talk a little fast, but open your Bible to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. When you find your place, please stand with me. <laughs> Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one of you examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another, for each one shall bear his own load. You may be seated. We have a saying around here that we are part, as a church, of the family of God. Now, as the family of God, we are to come alongside each other and help bear the load that we may be bearing that we may be taking. There may be people right now in our congregation right here, and you may have something going on that maybe nobody else knows about, and we as believers need to make sure that we come alongside if we find out and help you to carry your load. The Bible says, bear one another's burdens. We are to carry each other's burdens. Now, why do I say that this morning? Because, friend, life is difficult. Let me say that again. Life is very difficult. Going back to Galatians chapter 5, there is a continual battle between the flesh and the spirit. Now, if you're living the spirit-filled life, you know what I'm talking about. Every day there is a battle between the flesh and the spirit. This chapter 5 reveals the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. Now, the real fruit of the Spirit will only be produced in people who are born-again believers. The works of the flesh will continually be developed and shown forth in the life of an unbeliever. Also, if we are a Christian... We as Christians do not walk in the Spirit. If we do not, our old nature will make, its, uh, make itself known in our presence. Listen to Galatians chapter 5, verse 17. The flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And they are contrary one to another, so you cannot do the things that you would. As a result, my friend, we must crucify the flesh daily. Look at chapter 5 in Galatians and look at verse 19. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness. Wow, a bunch of them. Idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentious jealous, jealousies, outburst of wrath. It goes on to say envy, murder, drunkenness, and on and on it goes. Those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Is that what it says? Maybe a member of our church was arrested for a DUI. Hmm. Maybe a man in the church was caught with another woman other than his wife. Maybe a couple in our church got in a big fight and the police came to their home. Here's the question. What will you do as a brother or sister in Christ when something like that happens? A lot of times we want to jump on the bandwagon and we want to judge them right then, don't we? Somebody does something like that, and we automatically may want to condemn them. 
or will you go and tell others what you've heard? Will you look at them and think, you know what, I'm a whole lot better Christian than they are? Or will you ignore, like many of us do, the situation altogether? Now, none of those things are the right responses. The Bible says, restore them. Chapter 6, verse 1, brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. I want to give you three quick points and stay with me. First of all is our responsibility. Verse 1, if a man or a woman, a male or female, and by the way, there's only two genders. There's only two genders. Anybody who believes otherwise is just ignorant. If any man or woman is overtaken in any trespass, overtaken. Now, just as we have the wonderful privilege to lead somebody to Jesus Christ, we also have the wonderful privilege to bring them back into fellowship. Listen, friend, life is difficult, and we are not exempt from burdens and trials and tribulations and troubles and I'm talking to every one of us this morning. We all have burdens of one kind or another. I like what Charles Stanley said. He said, at some point, all of us struggle under the weight of a difficult situation. It might be a sin we cannot overcome. It might be a trial that just doesn't let up or a need that remains unmet. He said, Un however... There's no need to struggle through it alone because we have the support of fellow believers as we bear one another's burdens. The Bible says, if a man be overtaken. Now, what is implied here is the fact that the offender's sin has been brought to light. And the idea here is we are investing in the lives of our brothers and sisters in Christ. And by the way, I know there are some people in the church that you like to be around more than others. Some people call it cliques. Some people just call it a good group. There's nothing wrong with that, but we must step outside of our group and show our love to others who definitely have a need. Now, remember... When we ignore this, it does absolutely no good. And by the way, do not be afraid of making somebody upset. Do not be afraid that somebody might leave the church because you said something. So many people want to sweep it under the rug and act like it doesn't even go on. And when that happens, many times it gets worse and worse. It gets bigger and bigger. So the bottom line is this. When you truly care for somebody and they're in trouble, your desire should be to do whatever you got to do to get them back in fellowship. Amen. Amen. Now, this is part of the four specific ministries of the church, and I want to review that to you. Number one, we are to make disciples or we are to go after people to make them disciples. And that is called evangelism. And then we are to mark disciples and that's called baptism. Then we are to mature disciples and that's called discipleship. And then we are to mend disciples and that is called restoration. Verse one, if a man be overtaken in a fault... You know what that really means? That means he's been brought into sin by temptation. You may be out here, friend, and the devil be, may be wearing you out, and he may tempt you over and over again, 
And before you know it, you are falling into that temptation. And when you fall into that temptation, it becomes a sin. The man who is overtaken by willful sin is a Christian. And this person has not been living in the Spirit. And by the way, there is a difference this morning in being overtaken by fault and a premeditated sin. Let me give you an example. A man meets a friend for dinner. And the friend orders a pitcher of beer. The guy who arrived to meet his friend decides he's going to take a drink. They keep on drinking and keep on drinking. He orders another pitcher. And the man who came to meet his friend winds up drunk. Example number two, a man had a bad week. You ever had a bad week? On Friday, he already goes on planning. And when he gets off work, he's going to go, go and buy a case of beer. He's going to go home, and he's going to drink until. And that's what he does, and he gets drunk. Now, both men are wrong, and both men need to repent and get right with God. Amen? Amen. The second man committed premeditated sin. The first man was overtaken with a fault. You remember the parable of the hundred sheep and one went off by the wayside and they went after him. They found him. And when they found him, the shepherd was rejoicing. Now, in our church, in our churches, there are many sheep we have been over, that have been overtaken in a fault. Those sheep who are genuinely born again are precious to the Lord. And listen, friend, they ought to be precious to us. (coughs) They have failed, they have done wrong, and they need to be brought back. So what is our responsibility? Verse 1 tells us. And the word restore in verse 1 means a lot. It literally means to mend or repair. It carries the idea of setting a broken bone or repairing a dislocated limb. Now, John Piper said, and I quote, sin is a breakdown in the machinery of our life. It has to be repaired. If you find someone with a breakdown, do what you need to do in order to restore the person to good, godly, running condition. Well, let me give you a couple of requirements very quickly here. When you confront somebody, you confront them in the right spirit. Now, folks, we Baptists are mean. And many times we will go and approach somebody and we'll say it ugly to them because they've done something wrong. But you know what? We don't do anything wrong. But we need to go to them in the right spirit and we better spend a lot of time praying. Spend a lot of time praying before you go. We want to make sure that we say the right thing led by the Spirit, and what we say comes out across lovingly. Be kind and be gentle. It is so easy to talk harshly. It is so easy to talk hateful. You know what? Most people do not like confrontations. Now, if you are cheating on your wife, and we know about it, we better go and talk to you. That's pretty strong, isn't it? Verse 1 says, Brethren, that's born-again believers, but don't miss this. Also in verse 1, you who are spiritual. Being spiritual is not a competition. Or being in a higher plane than everybody else. Paul is asking those who are spiritual, mature, spirit-minded, walking in the spirit to do this, but we must be clean. (laughs) Now, if that does not describe you, you have no business whatsoever trying to approach anybody. Turn to Matthew 18 very quickly. Can't leave this out. 
and I know we're just out of time. The Bible says, first of all, in verse 15, if your brother sins against you, tell him his fault between you and him, and on and on you've gained your brother. You go to your brother, you show him, or you show the woman her fault, and if they listen and repent, you gain your brother or sister. A self-explanatory. Verse 16, if he won't hear you, take with you one or two more. You know why you take one or two more? Because you want everything to be on the up and up and out in the open so somebody can't come back and lie on you. Verse 17, if it doesn't work, we are to take it to the church to resolve the issue. It's getting tough now. Verse 18, are you ready? If it still doesn't work, we are to ask them to leave the church. Listen, if we allow immorality in the church, what does that do for our reputation? If the church has done all it can do, then this step is not cruel. It is for the good of the church. Now, we might be in a lawsuit, but we need to be biblical. Huh. Let me give you some results of all this process, and we'll be through. When the proper steps are take, taken in the way God's outlined, the church will see all kind of benefit. <coughs> Look at verse 2. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now, burdens are extra heavy loads. When we see a brother or sister under the load of some great burden, we need to do something about it. Let us see the need and then meet the need. Now, here's the great result. Jesus Christ will be pleased. The law of Christ, as mentioned in that verse, is to love your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus said in John 13, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I've loved you, that you also love one another. Now, some of you may know the name when I say Dr. Howard Hendricks. He tells the story of a young man who got back into fellowship that had been away from God because of one person who really loved him. Dr. Hendricks asked this Christian young man, how did it feel being away from the Lord? And the young man said, it seemed like I was way out in the sea. I was out there in the deep water, and I was in trouble. He said, all my friends were over there on the shore hurling biblical accusations at him about doing wrong. But he said, there was one Christian brother who actually swam out there where I was to get me, and when he arrived, I fought him, but he never did let go. He put a life jacket around me, and he took me to shore. And then he said, by the grace of God, he was the reason I was restored back into fellowship because he would not let me go. You know what we're talking about here, friend? It's all about loving the church and how we spread it around. We must get involved in one another's lives, and we must hold one another accountable. <laughs> Bearing one another's burdens can be messy. Messing with sin can be messy. Talking about someone to someone about their sin must be motivated by love. And, and I'm going to close with this right here. Accountability with a love for people, but not a love for God, 
ends up with unwise counsel. Accountability with a love for God but not a love for people ends up where you are condemning other men and women and boys and girls. So Christian, believer, listen up. This is what we are to be doing. Now, are we passing or are we failing? Are we willing to do what God told us to do? When you do all that, you know what you have? You have a pure church, and God honors that. I pray today you will take this message and you will very seriously consider the Word of God because it is surrounded and it's meant for all born-again believers. Today, if you need to be saved, we want you to be saved more than anything. If you need revival, we want you to have revival. If you need to come and join our church, won't you come? And if you need to come and pray at the altar, oh, my dear friend, we're moving very, very close to when Jesus is going to come. Every single day is like a newspaper article right out of the Word of God. Stand with me. Father, we thank you for the day. We thank you for all your blessings. I pray, God, that you will bless this invitation. I pray you'll be glorified in it. I pray, God, as uh, Tommy's on the way to the hospital, I pray, God, healing has already come. So, Father, just move in our church service in your way, in Jesus' name, amen.